All right, let's get our Bible out this morning. First Corinthians chapter three. I thought y'all might get a blessing out. Yeah, that was good. First Corinthians chapter three. Y'all pray for me this morning. It's hot here, first of all, but not as hot as it's going to be in hell. So I ain't got too much to gripe about. I'm not going there. So thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm saved by the grace of God. It's good to be in church with you this morning. Amen. I'm glad you came. You could have been anywhere else in the world this morning, but you got up and came to church. So thank God for that. And, uh, and let's give him glory this morning because that's what we're going to talk about. We've been talking over the last few weeks. Paul has talked about how these Corinthian Christians, and I don't know if you remember the title of this, uh, of this series of sermons, but the Corinthian church, the title of this is called the Carnal Church because they were carnal. They were in their flesh. They were living as wickedly just about as a church can live. And, uh, and Paul was trying to get them turned around. He was trying his best to get them to see that living for Jesus is what we ought to be doing. He was trying to get them to see that since they had been saved and Christ had done all that he had done and he had paid the price that he had paid for them, that they ought to do something in return, that they ought to live a life in return that reflected what had happened in, inside of them. And so we're going to look at that this morning, but let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Let's ask God to meet with us. Let's bow our heads for prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, your people. I thank you for the house of God. And Lord, I thank you for this group that's gathered assembled this morning. And Lord, we need to hear from you today. Lord, we can't do a thing without you, and we need you in everything that we do. Father, give us understanding of what, what lies ahead. <coughs> Help us to realize that the things we're going to talk about this morning are real. And it's something that every single person who's in this room, who's been washed in the blood of Jesus, who's saved, is going to have to go through. And Lord, I pray this morning that you'll give us, Lord, some clarity on this subject. You'll help us open our understanding and help us to see exactly what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. And may we apply it to ourselves here at the church at Temple in Clarksville. Father, help us to realize these things are just as important to us as they were to that church. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit of God, you'll give me the wisdom, give me the ability to preach this in a clear manner, and Lord, communicate this truth to your people. Father, I give you all the glory and the praise this morning. I ask you to cleanse me, forgive me, fill me with your Holy Ghost, and pour me out on your people, and I'll give you praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate your attendance in the house of God. Pray for those who couldn't be here. we got folks out sick this morning, and they need your prayers. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we will go ahead and read this this morning. We'll read down through there to the end of the chapter. I'm going to start. I want to start there where we left off last week. We left off, uh, verse, we left off in verse 8. We're going to pick up in verse 8, and we're going to read down through the end of the chapter this morning. The Bible says, Now he that planteth, and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. If you've got a pencil or a pen, you might want to underline that statement. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. When you go work somewhere, and you're working next to a guy named Joe on your job, and Joe's working hard, you're not going to get Joe's paycheck. You're getting your paycheck. Right? You shouldn't expect to get paid for what somebody else done, right? You shouldn't give. You shouldn't expect to get paid more than what you did. If you only, if you work on commission and and, and you sell an encyclopedia and, and you're supposed to have a quota of, of selling three sets a week, you only sell one a week. Guess what? Your paycheck is not going to be what it ought to be. And we're talking about being rewarded according to our works this morning. We're not talking. I want to make this clear before we get anywhere into this. The message of salvation is nowhere in this message. Okay? I'm not preaching on salvation. I'm not preaching on you gaining, getting salvation. I'm not preaching on whether or not you lose salvation. You can't. But I'm not talking about that this morning. Nowhere in this message. So don't even let the devil whisper in your ear, he's talking about you losing yourself. Because I'm not. Okay? This is all about what you do from the day you get saved until you stand before the feet of Jesus Christ in heaven. Okay? This, that's exactly what this is about. It's about your work as a believer from here 
to eternity. Okay? And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So you, you pray for me this morning because I've got a lot of places I've got to turn to. And I want to cover this. And I don't want to make, I don't want to make this harder for you to get than it has to be. But I want you to understand that when God is talking about things, uh, a lot of times He uses metaphor. He uses uh, pictures, word pictures, to get us to understand heavenly things. Jesus told parables, which were earthly, earthly pictures to picture heavenly things. So that's kind of the way Paul is putting this. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get this all figured out in just a minute. But I want you to notice here, again, verse 9. Look, in, look down at your Bible, verse 9. Okay? For we, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given, is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. Let, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive you. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He that he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether a Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, I ask you again, Lord, help me now as I preach. I pray for your power now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Let's get in. I ain't prayed twice in a long time, so <laughs> I hope that helped. Amen. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a double powerful message. All right? But I want you to notice there in verse 9. Paul gives a three-point outline right there. You see it? He said we are, number one, we're laborers together with God. He gives the next point. He said ye are God's husbandry. The third point, ye are God's building. Okay? So laborers, husbandry, and building. What in the world is Paul talking about? Okay? If I looked at you and said, y'all are all workers with God, you're God's farm, and you're God's house. You said, what? Well, what is he talking? Again, he's speaking, he's, well, he's kind of speaking metaphorically because he says you're laborers together with God. Yes, God wants us to work for him. How does God want us to work for him? He wants us to work for him by obeying his commandments, by being Christ-like, by being, by being an extension of his, his hands into this world, by being an extension of his, of his heart into this world. His words into this world. We are to labor in ministry, bringing other souls into the kingdom of God, uh, building up the body of Christ. And of course, we can't do that. God does it through us, but we're His laborers. Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and we are left here with the Holy Spirit living in us since we got saved, empowering us and guiding us and, 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 and controlling us as, as we do God's work because we can't do God's work. God does it through us. He enables us or gives us the capability to do that. He says here, God's husbandry. That means, again, we're, we're kind of like a farm. And, and you know, a, a farmer has to till that soil, and, and then he plants the seed, and he tends to the seed, and he waters it, and it grows, and it pr produces 
a, a profit. It produces a, a crop, something that, that can be useful, something that's profitable. And again, our lives, we're not to just get saved and just and, and just sit there and wait on Jesus like a like a, a plot of land that nobody ever put a plow to that's just overgrown with weeds and, and, and just gets thicker and thicker and more underbrush and, and is worthless to anybody for use. God doesn't intend for a believer to be like that. He intends for us to produce and, 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 and bear fruit and have a profit for him. But that's not the one we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we're going to look at the building part. But I want to say this too. Uh, Christ is the head of the church. Amen? Amen. Hey, the Bible tells us that Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church when it comes to a building. But you know, Jesus is also, Jesus is also the husband and the church is the bride. Amen? And we're going to have a wedding someday and we're going to be married to the Lord Jesus. And again, I'm not going into that. I'm just kind of throwing some thoughts out there to you. In Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 32, he gives the, he gives the whole teaching on the, the husband, uh, Christ being the head and, and the body being uh, the body of Christ being the church like the wife. And that's where we get the, the uh, teaching that we usually give when somebody gets married to teach them how to, how to, how to have a marriage, a successful marriage just like Christ in the church, such as the husband and the wife. And, of course, I ain't got time to go into all that this morning. But I want you to understand that a lot of things are, are spoken of in word pictures when it comes to Christ and his church. Um, <clears throat> but let's look, let's, look at our, let's look at our scripture here this morning. So he says, According to the grace of God which is given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Now, what is he saying there? He said, <coughs> according to the grace of God given to me as a wise master builder. God called Paul out. He, said, he, he called him out, and he, uh, he uh, equipped him. He, he gave him instruction, and he sent him out to go and be the first missionary that ever was and go and preach the gospel in foreign lands to strange people who had never heard of Christ and to preach salvation and get them saved and, 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 uh, and bring them in faith to God and start churches, establish churches. And that's what he did. He went out as a wise master builder trying to build up believers, build up a, a, a house, build up a, a, a body of Christ for the Lord. And that's that, again, that's what he did. He said, the Lord sent me out as a wise master builder. And he said, I laid the foundation. And another buildeth their own. But let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And let me make this plain. When you're going to build, if you're going to build a house, you better make sure you put a good foundation there. Especially if you do it around here. Especially if you do it south of 82. Especially if you do it down where I live. On black land. Because black land moves like the waves of an ocean. Don't it, man? You'll, you'll, you'll have, don't it, Shirley? Y'all have to show Shirley showed me cracks in her wall when I came over there. Where the, where the foundation's moving. And again, so the foundation is important. That you have a good, solid foundation. And Paul, Paul was not saying that he... I want you to understand when he says... For when he says, uh, let me get make sure he said, uh, what verse am I in? <laughs> ten. Yeah, verse ten. You're right. Uh -huh. Yes, he said, I have laid the foundation. Now, what is Paul saying there? Paul saying I died for your sins. Paul saying I gave myself for you and bore your sins. No, he's not. Look at verse. Look at verse eleven. He said, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ laid the foundation. When he died for us, when he shed his blood, when he went to the, when he went to the cross and died and was buried and rose from the grave, he laid the foundation of our salvation. Everything we have as a believer is built upon the foundation of our Savior. So when Paul said in verse 10, he said, I have laid the foundation and another build it their own, he's not saying I died for your sins. He's saying when I came to Corinth, I preached Jesus. I laid the foundation there. I came in and I preached Christ. Hey, what did he say? When I came to you, I determined not to know anything. He said, say Christ and Him crucified. So he came and he preached Christ and Him crucified. And those people got saved. So the foundation is laid. And he said, and another, 
and another build of their own. He's obviously referring to Apollos, which was the next person. You know, they were having disputes over who was following who. I'm following. I'm of Paul. Another said, I'm of Apollos. Another said, I'm of Cephas, which is Peter. So again, he's saying, look, he's, he's following up on those things that he said. Okay, he's trying to get them straightened out on all the divisions in their church. That's what this is leading up to. These are not three different, separate sermons on different subjects. They're all tied together. Again, they were carnal. They, were, they, were, they weren't focused on serving God. They were focused on self. They were all about themselves and the world and what they were and who they were and all about their prestige and, and look at me, I'm somebody. They weren't humble. They weren't serving God the way they would. They should. And he told them, I can't talk to y'all like grown Christian folks. i got to talk to y'all like a bunch of lost folks, like a bunch of babies who can't understand anything, who can't get off the milk. So, again, he's trying to get them to see by giving them this picture of what's going to happen when you die, when you go to be with the Lord, so that they see the seriousness of getting, uh, of getting to work for Jesus. And I want you to see that as the church, our church this morning, how serious it is that we get busy about going to work for Jesus. All right? So he said, again, he's got the foundation laid, and he said, if any man, if any man build upon this foundation, okay, if any man build upon this foundation, that's what you are to do as a believer. Again, you didn't lay the foundation. Jesus did, right? Somebody else told you about Jesus and they laid that foundation in your life and somebody else is, is, is trying to teach you how to live the Christian life. Well, that's this fellow up here this morning. Amen. And anybody else that you listen to who's instructing you in the way of the Lord. What are we doing? We're giving you teaching on how you are to build a life for Christ so that when you die, you have something to show for the time that you spent down here as a saved child of God. So he's going to talk this morning about the materials that go into a building for God. He said, for no other man can... Uh, okay, Jesus is the foundation. Verse 12. Now if any man build... Upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Those are the building materials that are listed that can be used. Now, again, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. These, these materials don't all go together. If you go over to to Greece and to into Italy, different places where there's ruins, where all these great cities used to be, you'll see some wonderful where they've excavated like marble slabs and granite columns and things, and then up on top of it would be clay and, and wood and stuff rotting and, and and it's like they tried to build with shoddy materials on top of good materials, uh, and things don't last like that. But let's, let's look at the materials here because I don't believe that God put anything in his word just randomly. I think everything has a reason for being there. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I know exactly what, why he put this here, why he put that there. I, I can't tell you that for sure. But I can tell you what, I, what I've gained from this. When I look at gold, silver, and precious stones, what I see from the word of God and what I, what I see from just experience of looking at gold and silver and those types of things. But these first three building materials are clearly superior to the last three. And these first three, these represent the things that God would have us build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first one, gold, first, first of all. God would have us to, to, to build upon this salvation that we have, gold. Gold is pure, right? Gold is precious. Gold is sought after. <clears throat> you, you know, you can have gold for 100 years and pull it out. You know it ain't got a speck of rust on it. It doesn't tarnish. It might dull, but you can shine it up and just with a little effort. But it doesn't tarnish. It doesn't turn like silver does. Gold stays uh, pretty. I, again, I, I know, I know it, 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 can, it can dull, but it won't tarnish like silver. Fire doesn't destroy gold. You can put as much fire, much heat on gold as you want. It'll melt, 
but you'll still have as much gold left there when the fire's out as you had when it started. Matter of fact, fire, fire doesn't destroy it. Fire just makes gold stronger, they say. And as far as we know, gold lasts forever. Now, I know the Bible talks about the elements burning up with fervent heat in the end, and, and maybe the gold burns up then. I don't know, but I know this. There's just as much gold on planet Earth right now as there was when God, God made the Earth. We ain't lost any. It's all been melted, been in people's mouths, been around people's necks, on their fingers, and everywhere on top of buildings. They put it everywhere, but it's still there. It ain't gone anywhere. Gold lasts. Amen? Uh, 1 Peter 1, seven. I'm going to turn over there real quick and give you that. Uh, but again, it, it's it's a, it's a it's a pure thing. First Peter one seven. The trial that the trial of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Again, gold's precious, gold's pure. Uh, Jesus said in Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You know, some other things I know about gold. It's mined. People have, you know, you don't, you, don't walk down, you don't walk down the street and find just gold laying everywhere. You, you, you find something, let me know. I'll come help you gather it up. But, you know, people don't just find gold. They have to go looking for it. They have to go usually to, to remote places where other people don't usually go to. They usually have to go through great pains to get that gold. They usually have to, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if y'all ever watched that show Gold Rush when it first came on. I thought that was the greatest show ever was when, I, when it first came on. I loved watching them. They were, and people, they were just going through all kinds. It seemed like every time they turned around, they had another hardship. And one hardship after another, but they persevered and persevered and persevered. And man, when they find the gold, you talk about the joy that would hit them. All the happiness, man, they were so happy. Uh, you know, but you saw the struggles that they went through trying to get it. I've watched that show Burying the Sea Gold, where the people get on those little floating things and go out there and go underwater. They're digging, they're digging with a hose. You've got a hose, they're moving rocks, they're sucking the stuff up, and they're going through a dredge and, and removing. You know, that's these things that I see about gold, it, it's so fitting, it fits with the with the with the Christian life. Because again, people give up their lives for. They leave everything to go and live in a rustic condition. So, I mean, and, and put up with hardships to get that gold. To come home and say, look what I got. Look what I got. Why? Because it makes them wealthy. Let me tell you something. The things of this world that the people of the church of Corinth were searching after was like trash compared to what God has for them. Uh, you know, again, they weren't mining for what God had. They weren't, they weren't digging for what God had. They weren't separating themselves from the garbage of this world as a gold miner does. When he comes, listen, when he comes in with his gold, he doesn't throw all the trash and everything else in the pan to weigh it and see what he's got. No, he separates all that garbage and cleans that gold and makes sure it's beside itself. It's, it's pure and it's all together. My friends, if we love the Lord with all our heart, we're going to try to get as close to Him as we possibly can. We're going to be looking for nuggets of truth in the Word of God. We're going to be lifting Him up and saying, Look what I found. Look what I have. We want others to see what we have in Jesus. You see, gold's precious. Folks, somebody's got a beautiful gold ring. You know what? They want people to notice they got it on. Right? That's why ladies wear jewelry. They want people to see it. Look what I got on. That's why you ladies have necklaces around your neck this morning. You want somebody to see what you're wearing. Why? Because it's pretty. And you know it's pretty and you want people to see your pretty jewelry. Well, listen, again, God wants people to see the beauty of His, of his truth in our life. And that's gold. Gold is, gold is pure, like the truth. Amen? And it has to be separated from the trash around it so that it can be beautified. So God says we're to build upon our life gold. Amen? That means separating ourselves from this old filthy world so that we are able to mine and dig out of God's Word truth that we can, that we can hold up and, and let glorify the Lord. That makes sense? Amen? Amen. I, I hoped it did. But then I see the second one. I see silver. Let me turn over here to Psalms. 
I see silver. <clears throat> Psalm verse, chapter 12, verse 26. I'm sorry, ch chapter 12, verse 6. The Bible says the words of the Lord are as pure, are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Silver is a symbol of purification. It's also a symbol of redemption too, but I don't have time to go into all that. But it's it's a it's a symbol of purification. Let me let me look over chapter sixty six of Psalms. I got one more verse I'm gonna read to you on that. <clears throat> Psalm sixty six and verse ten. For thou, O God, hast proved us; thou hast tried us, as silver is tried. Again, it's a symbol of purification. When, when silver is, again, silver is mined just like gold. They go in and they, take, they find it in the rocks. They'll find a seam of silver or, uh, or a vein of silver, and they'll take and they'll mine that out. They'll, they'll break that chunk of silver out, and they'll take it to a refiner, uh, which he takes it to a smelting pot. Once he's removed as much trash as he can from the silver, and then he places that silver in the smelting pot, and then he turns a flame on under it, a high, a high, uh, a high heat flame, and, and he begins to to melt that silver. And as that silver melts, it turn, you know, it turns to a liquid and trash. When it gets to a certain heat, trash become be, begins to. Uh, to rise to the to the surface of it. Let me turn. I got one more place I want to look at in Proverbs. Proverbs twenty five and verse four. Again, he, uh, the the flame heats the silver, and the the impurities, the dross, if you will, in the silver begins to rise to the surface. And and the 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 uh, refiner he takes a little tool. And as it comes to the surface, he takes and he rakes that trash off the top, and and then he he uh, he watches that that silver carefully as it goes through these this fiery trial. What what verse did I say? Verse verse uh, four, twenty five and verse four. The Bible says, "Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer, for the refiner, if you will." So. Again, what are we? We're vessels for the Lord. The Lord wants to fill us, and He wants to pour us out on somebody else. But He's not going to make a vessel out of out of trashy silver, because that trashy silver would corrode. It would it, it would it wouldn't hold up. It would it would be uh, impure. It wouldn't be fit for His use, and it wouldn't it wouldn't function properly. And so He has to remove that dross. And again, it's purification. It, it's it, it's it's getting us to the point of being useful to God. That's what it's this pictures. And, and again, like a refiner taking the dross off, God carefully watches us as He allows us to go through fiery trials in life. You may be going through something right now, and you say, I don't understand why I'm going through this. It could be that God has allowed this thing to come into your life because there's something in you that He wants removed. And you haven't been willing to come to Him and lay that thing down to Him and say, Lord, I want to, I want to repent and sacrifice this to You. Lord, take me and use me. I can't be used of You as useful as You want me to be with this thing in my life, with this situation in my life, whatever it may be. I don't know, but God knows and You know. So God, He allows fiery trials to come into our life like the heat underneath that silver. And again, it just takes us to where we're just absolutely... Melted in his hands. Oh God, help me. Help me or I ain't going to make it. And God says, okay, let's get that out of your life. And once that gets out of your life, what, what, a, what a joy. What a joy when, when, when you're relieved of that thing that you didn't know was burdening you down, that you didn't know was holding you back. Do you know what's so good about God? Just like the refiner. The refiner don't take his eyes off the silver because if he takes his eyes off the silver uh, and, he, and he doesn't watch the heat just so that silver can be damaged. And so he's got to be careful as he, as he refines that silver. Uh, and he, and he allow, again, he allows that heat to bring the impurity to, be, to the surface to be removed by him. And it happens over and over and over 
And some of y'all know where I'm going with this, but some of you don't. And how does the jeweler or how does the refiner know when the silver has been refined to where it's useful for him? Well, he keeps skimming that trash off the top. And at last, there's no more trash. And he can see himself in the silver. Think on that. God is allowing things to happen in your life. He's allowing troubles to come into your life to make you uncomfortable enough that you release these things that hold you back from serving Him. And once enough of these things are out, He's able to see His reflection in you. And you're able to be useful to God like He wants you to be. So we've looked at the gold, we've looked at the silver, and now we look at the precious stones. You know, it's helpful whenever you're reading the Bible and you're trying to figure out something. It's, it's helpful to, there's, there's the law of first mention, which means you go back and look at the first time something is mentioned in the Bible. And, and God, God does that in order to give us a, a place to work off of. The first time he mentions something, it's usually consistent throughout the Word of God. And, and the first mention of precious stones is in 2 Samuel Chapter 12 and verse 30. I'm not going to turn there, but I'll tell you what it was about. It was about a king being a crown being taken off of a king's head. And that crown was made of gold and it contained precious stones. And again, we're talking about we're going to be talking about crowns in connection with the judgment seat of Christ. And and, and again, this is where we're headed. We're not going to cover all this today. <clears throat> but again, those precious stones connected with a crown which crowns will be given to Jesus at that judgment seat of Christ. And again, we'll get to that. But the precious stones, again, he mentioned these building materials, gold, silver, and precious stones. Well, precious stones were also brought to Solomon by the queen of Sheba. When she came, she brought him, I want to say 666 talents of gold and a bunch of precious stones. She brought to him because of, he was so wise and she wanted to give him a great gift. But we find precious stones in the Bible, and I think it's really what this is about. If you want to look over in Zechariah, and I know that's maybe hard for you to find, but it's almost at the end of the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament. Zechariah. Oh, I said Zechariah, didn't I? It's right. Yeah, Zechariah is right before Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. But Zechariah, verse chapter nine, and verse. 16. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 16. It says, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, and they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Okay, he's referring to people as these precious stones in a crown. Now we're going to look over in, in uh, Malachi 3.17. Malachi 3.17. Malachi 3.17, the Bible says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. That's talking about, that's talking about the people of God. Amen. Listen, again, we're referred to as jewels. I thought about that song as I was getting this together. It doesn't say jewels, but the, it says, Will there be any stars in my crown, in my crown, when at evening the sun goeth down? When, let's see. When at evening I... I can't remember. The, no, in, in the morning when I rise, where, where so, I can't remember. Will there be any stars in my crown? But I, I assume that's referring to these precious stones. What would I see this as? I see this as the people we've, we've brought into the kingdom of God. The people we've ushered in. Souls that we've witnessed to. People that we've told about Jesus. They'll be like precious stones in a crown. Amen? So what do we see here that God's telling us to build upon this foundation of Jesus Christ? He's saying we need to get in the Word of God and we need to get to know Jesus. We get, need to get to know the Lord. We need to mine the Scriptures for the truth of the Word of God. And when we get it out, we need to take it and show it to other people. We need to build our life on doing that. And, and secondly, we need to understand that the, word, the, the troubles that we go through in this world, listen, they're not for our hurt. God's using those things to build us up, to make us 
and make us uh, better for Him, to make us, uh, in order for Him to be able to use us to clean the junk out of our life so that we're functional for Him. And then the precious stones, again, that's, that's people we're supposed to be witnessing to along the way. So we have the truth of the Word of God. We're cleaned by the, by the fire of God, and we're working to bring the, uh, souls into the kingdom of God. Paul said, listen, that's what we need to be building upon this life of Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice what he contrasts that with. He contrasts that with wood, with hay, and with stubble. Well, can I tell you something? When you cut a tree down and you send it to a lumber yard and they, or to a to a uh, to a mill and they run that thing through the saw mill and they cut it up into two by sixes and two by fours and one by eights and whatever they cut it into. I mean, they they cut it into all different sizes. But can I tell you something? That wood's dead. It's dead as a doornail. It ain't never going to have any more life in it. It just gets more, more dead as time goes by. Hey, that's grass that used to live, but now it's dead. It's just drying and drying and drying. And pretty soon, it'll turn into stubble, which is nothing more than wood dust. Now, you know what? All three of them things are as dead as can be. And they don't make good building materials on top of the things that God has told us to build with. God is not about us filling our life and building upon the living foundation of Jesus Christ with dead works. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the life that we live outside of a life of Jesus Christ is dead. All the things that we think are so important in this world are, are dead outside of Jesus Christ. Let's read the rest of this, this, this chapter. We've got five minutes. I think we can finish it. <clears throat> He said, every man's work shall be made manifest. That means every man. You see that? Every? That's you. That means you're not getting out of this. That means if you're saved, you're part of this. You better hear me because this is you and this is talking about you and it's really going to happen to you. Every man's work. So listen, one of these days you're either going to die or the rapture is going to take place and you're going to be translated and you're going to be brought up into the presence of God. Now whether this thing happens as soon as we step into glory or whether it happens sometime later after we're in glory, I don't know. I can't tell you. God didn't put a date on it. But I can tell you this. It don't happen down here right now. It's going to happen when we get to, see, when we get to be with Jesus. So the Bible tells us here, that every man's work shall be manifest. So there's going to come a day when all the redeemed are going to be gathered uh, around the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us is going to have our moment where we're going to stand by ourselves. Not with your preacher, not with your mama, your daddy, your granny, your grandpa. None of them are going to be there. It's going to be you and Jesus. And you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to understand something. Every man's... Does it say every man's salvation? Doesn't say you're going to be judged on your salvation, does it? Every man's work. Every man's work. Are you doing anything for Jesus today? Are you have you been doing anything for Jesus? Are you planning to do anything for Jesus? If you're not, there's not going to be anything for you there. If you hadn't been, there's not going to be anything for you there. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What fire are we talking about? Is that hell? No, it's not hell. The Bible says God, our God is a consuming fire. We're talking about His righteousness. We're talking about the fire of His righteousness. Anything that, that tries to present itself as something that, that's not holy, that's not righteous, the fire of God is going to consume it, and it'll be gone. And there won't be no, but what about, what about that? Can I tell you, there have been times that I've got up and preached, and I got done, and I thought, boy, that was a good sermon. And somebody come up to me and said, well, you preached a good sermon. I said, thank you very much. And you know what? I don't get nothing for that. You know why? Because I like to get told, hey, that was a good sermon. That was, hey, you did good. I enjoyed the praise. So I got the praise instead of God getting it, and I don't get a reward for it. If you and I sat down, and took us a notebook pad. And we started writing down. You, make a, you ought to go home after, you, after we get done here. Go home after you eat your bite of lunch. And, and get you a notepad. And take a pen. And write down the things that you have done for Jesus. That you didn't get any credit for. That you did because you loved him. And you didn't want any credit. 
and, and nobody did anything for you as a result, you'd have a very short list. And that's what we're going to be judged on. Anything that we did, that we took credit, that we got glory, that people talked good about us and bragged on us and we got all swollen up inside, yes, I did good. No reward. Because it's for Christ or it ain't rewarded. <clears throat> any man's work, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So if it survives the, the righteous fire of God and it ain't dead works of this world and it's something that was done for Christ looking to give him glory, the Bible said he shall receive a reward. You know, when a man goes to uh, run a race in the Olympics or enter in a competition in the Olympics, you know, they put them through all kinds of tests. They got, I mean, not just drug tests, but supplement tests and all kinds of tests. And if they've done anything that would jeopardize them doing it right, they don't get to win an award. You know that? If they find out, listen, if they get, if they get in a 40-yard, 40 40-meter 40 dash or whatever they call it now, I don't even know what it is, one of those races, and say, man, somebody just blows everybody away, and they give them the award, and they get ready to get up on the platform, but they've done it. They, they, checked, their, they, they checked their blood because something was squirrely here. We have to do a blood test on them, and it comes up. If they've been taking some kind of a supplement that ain't allowed, guess what? They don't win. They don't get the medal. You know what? The Bible talks about a man must strive lawfully. We're to strive lawfully. That means we're to do it God's way, not the way we think it ought to be done, but God's way. And... Again, if we want reward, then we're going to have to do it right. If we don't want it to be burned up, we've got to do it to serve the Lord. We need to, we need to serve Him selflessly. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yeah, we'll stand there and think, all of that, I thought, I thought I was doing right, but I was being selfish and I didn't even realize it. And it'll be gone. But the Bible says, but he himself shall be saved. See, God's never going to... Even if you were lousy in serving God, even if you were terrible, 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 and you wasted your life, but you were saved, when it all comes down to it, God will take you to salvation. But you may be standing there with a handful of ashes. You may be standing there with a realization that I didn't love him like I should have. I didn't give him what I should have. Look at what he did for you. Look with, look with the eyes of faith at what Christ has done for you and measure that by what you've done for him. And I know you'll never be able to measure up, but are you even trying? Have you even put forth an effort? How does God feel about your effort? Now let's keep going. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Verse 16 says, no, you're not. Don't you know that you're the temple of God? Think about that. You, my friend, if you're saved, if you come to Him for salvation, He has saved you and He has moved in and He lives in you. He's got His Holy Spirit living in you, the third person of the Trinity. God, the Holy Ghost, lives in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I don't care what anybody said about you. I don't care what anybody thinks about you. God says you're His temple. And the, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. He said if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. What does that mean? That means if you get saved, and you just throw your life away, and you just waste it living like a heathen, God's going to take you out. The Bible says in the Word, there's a sin unto death. That means there's a line out there somewhere. If we just keep on living like we want to, and living for this world, and living for the pleasures of this world, as a child of God, God says, you know what? You're ruining your testimony. You're making me look bad. And there's going to be a time when you take another step in that direction. I'm going to take you home. So you quit ruining my name down there. That God won't do it. There's a lot of people He sure has took off this planet. Because of it. I'm going to tell you something this morning. I stood a step from it. 
back in 1997, or 1996 rather, February 2nd, 1996, it's, it's on the front of one of my Bibles. <clears throat> that night, God gave me an ultimatum. He said, you're going to live for me or I'm going to take you. And I knew it. I knew it a minute. I can't tell you how he told me that, but I knew it in my heart. And that was the night I gave up. And I said, you can have me. Three months later, I surrendered to the ministry. I was already saved, but I was backslid as a devil. Now listen, I, I thank God he had mercy. And I thank God he'll show mercy to you this morning if you need it. Because God is a merciful God. But let me tell you something. The Bible says, let no man deceive himself. And the reason it says that is because we do. We deceive ourselves. The Bible says, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world... In other words, he, he, he knows all about this world and things this world, but he don't know a thing about God. If any man seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. In other words, that's by the world's standards that he may be wise. You know what? The world looks at us down here sitting in this church house this morning, and they say, oh, look at them fools down there. Look at them fools down there hanging on, clinging to their religion. They ain't got the real world. Get with stuff that's real. Well, I tell you what, this real world's going to burn up. Someday, and what we have in Christ is going to live forever. Amen. So don't worry about what this world thinks. Amen. The wisdom of this world, the Bible says, is foolishness with God. Because they're fools. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Hey, I think about those mice when they reach over and they sneak over to that mouse trap. They say, man, look at there. Somebody left some cheese right out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's right there. All I do is get it. Take the wise and the craftiness. They think that, oh, I get one over on God. No, you won't. No, you won't. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are in vain, that they, they come to nothing. And so he's telling these people who are, who are carnal because they're worldly wise, but they're not God wise. He's telling them, and he's telling us this morning, listen, the Lord knows your thoughts. If you think you know something, but you don't know the Word of God, you don't know anything. Get in the Word of God and learn it. Learn who God is. Get to know God. Get, let him, and listen, He knows you. You need to know Him. And He know again, He knows the thoughts of the wise, that they're vain, that they're empty. Let, therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours. Again, He's saying, listen. Those of you who are thinking one preacher is better than the other and you're better because you follow that preacher, he says, listen, whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all of yours, listen, you're a child of God. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus. Listen, you have a home in heaven. God has given everything to you. Why are you clinging to one man thinking he's all that? Quit being like the world. Quit following after people. Follow the Lord Jesus. And he said, he said, and you're Christ. That means you're his purchased possession. Let me remind you this morning again before we go. Every single one of you in here this morning who've been, who've been saved by the grace of God, it cost the most expensive price that has ever been paid for any item in the entire history of the world to pay for you. Because it cost the blood of God's own precious Son to pay for you. And God did not spare the blood of His own Son. He did not spare Him. No, God the Father and all the angels of heaven turned their back and let Jesus die alone, crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And He felt what you and I ought to feel. He felt, He felt God. Turning his back on him. He felt that separation from God. He knew the pain, the excruciating pain that would follow. He knew it. He felt it. He experienced it all for you and I. Now having had that much price paid for you, what are you giving him back in return? Are you building on that foundation anything that will amount to anything? If we could look at what you've built since you've been saved, would you want anybody to see it? Or would you want to throw a tarp over it and hope nobody could see it? Or would there be anything to throw a tarp over? 
I'm not trying to make you feel bad this morning. God's doing that. I'm not trying to because, listen, I got my... Let me tell you something. This, the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ is one of the scariest things to me. And I say that because I'm not worried about hell. I don't worry about hell. I, my sins are gone. All I have, what I have to be concerned about is displeasing my Lord. The thought of me standing before my Jesus someday and looking in his eyes and seeing disapproval, seeing him ashamed of me. The Bible talks about people being ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be that. I don't want I don't want to hear the trumpet and and shake and tremble going, I don't have any more time. I waited too long. I can't do anything now. And so I'll have to stand there with empty hands and say, Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. There won't be a do over. You say, Well, you get to go to heaven? Yeah. You'll still get to go. Yeah. You know what? You're gonna come back and rule with him for a thousand years, too. And I can tell you this. Based on what you have on that foundation, that will determine where your service is down here during those thousand years. Some of us might not even make dog catcher. And then some of us may have wonderful places of prestige, but it's all going to be determined on, like Paul said, let me read it one more time, and we're going to be done. <clears throat> Every man shall receive his own reward, his own reward, according to his own labor. Let's stand together. I urge you this morning, as we get ready to sing a song of invitation, as we get ready to pray, don't sit and think about, we're going home now, we're going home. No, right now, we need to think about where we are with God. Are you saved? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? That's wonderful. But are you serving him? Have you got rewards waiting on you? My, my suggestion to you this morning, if God has dealt with you this morning about that, and you say, you know, I need to get busy for Jesus. I ain't got much time left. I don't know how much time i got. My suggestion would be, as quickly as you can, get somewhere and start talking to God about it. As quickly as you can, come to him and say, Lord, I'm so sorry I've messed up so long and I haven't done what I ought to do. I'm so sorry I've been falling after the things of this world. I'm so far, sorry that I get caught up in the things of this world and it draws my attention away and I forget to serve you and forget to show you what you, what you rightfully deserve. If God's dealing with you this morning, would you come into business with God? You don't have to do it at this altar, but that's a great place to do it. You can do it right where you sit, but it sure would be better if you come and humbled yourself before God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I just love you and I thank you so much for loving us. I thank you, Father, that, you, that, you, that you've given us eternal life and, Lord, that there's a home waiting on us in heaven. But, Father, help us to realize while we're here, we've got some work to do. Lord, we need, we need, to, be, we need to be better children. We need to honor you because you're our Father. We need to show you the love that you've shown us. Father, help us. Holy Spirit of God, Convict us of our sins. Draw us, Lord, to the place of repentance. Give us, Lord, grace to, to, to get up from there and, and, Lord, to begin to walk in your power and your strength. And, Lord, in your grace. Lord, I just pray you'd help us now. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. 154.
I pray that if God is dealing with you about something, that, that you'll that you'll get it right. That you won't walk out of here and forget it, but that you'll you'll find a place where you can talk to God. I hope you will, and I hope God will strengthen you, and that you'll get you'll get deeper in your relationship with Him. Amen.